Chapters 14 through 19, Book 2, Volume 1 of La Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chandra Juello. La Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1 by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 2, Chapters 14 through 19. Chapter 14. Then they rode three or four days, and never met with adventure, and by hap they were lodged with a gentle man, that was a rich man, and well at ease. And as they sat at their supper, Balin overheard one complain grievously by him in a chair. "'What is this noise?' said Balin. "'Forsooth,' said his host, "'I will tell you. I was but late at a jousting, and there I jousted with a knight, that his brother under King Pelham, and twice smote I him down, and then he promised to quit me on my best friend, and so he wounded my son, that cannot be whole till I have of that knight's blood, and he rideth away invisible. But I know not his name. Ah, said Balin, I know that knight. His name is Garlin. He hath slain two knights of mine in the same manner. Therefore I had liefer meet with that knight than all the gold in this realm, for the despite he hath done me. Well, said his host, I shall tell you. King Pelham of Lysdenes hath made do cry in all this country a great feast that shall be within these twenty days, and no knight may come there but if he bring his wife with him or his paramour. And that knight, your enemy and mine, ye shall see that day. Then I behote you, said Balin, part of his blood to heal your son withal. We will be forward to morn, said his host. So on the morn all three rode toward Pelham, and they had fifteen days' journey, and they came thither, and that same day began the great feast. And so they alighted, and stabled their horses, and went into the castle. But Balin's host might not be let in, because he had no lady. Then Balin was well received, and brought unto a chamber, and unarmed him, and there were brought him robes to his pleasure, and would have had Balin leave his sword behind. Nay, said Balin, that do I not, for it is the custom of my country, a knight always keep his weapon with him, and that custom will I keep, or else I will depart as I came. Then they gave him leave to wear his sword, and so he went unto the castle, and was seen among knights of worship, and his lady afore him. Soon Balin asked a knight, Is there not a knight in this court whose name is Garland? Yonder he goeth, said the knight, he with the black face. He is the marvellous knight that is now living, for he destroyeth many good knights, for he goeth invisible. Ah, well, said Balin, is that he? Then Balin advised him long. If I slay him here, I shall not escape, and if I leave him now, peradventure I shall never meet with him again at such a Stephen, and much harm he will do an he live. Therewith this Garland espied that this Balin beheld him, and then he came and smote Balin on the face with the back of his hand, and said, Knight, why beholdest me so? For shame, therefore, eat thy meat, and do that thou came for. Thou sayest sooth, said Balin, this is not the first despite that thou, thou hast done me, and therefore I will do what I came for, and rose up fiercely and clave his head to the shoulders. Give me the truncheon, said Balin to his lady, wherewith he slew your knight. Anon she gave it to him, for always she bare the truncheon with her. And therewith Balin smote him through the body, and said openly, With that truncheon thou hast slain a good knight, and now it sticketh in thy body. And then Balin called on to his host, saying, Now may ye fetch blood enough to heal your son withal. Chapter 15 Anon all the knights arose from the table for to set on Balin, and King Pelham himself arose up fiercely and said, Knight! Hast thou slain my brother? Thou shalt die, therefore, or thou depart. Well, said Balin, do it yourself. Yes, said King Pelham, there shall no man have ado with thee but myself, for the love of my brother. Then King Pelham caught in his hand a grim weapon, and smote eagerly at Balin. But Balin put the sword betwixt his head in the stroke, and therefore his sword burst it sunder. And when Balin was weaponless, he ran into a chamber for to seek some weapon, and so from chamber to chamber, and no weapon he could find, and always King Pelham after him. And at the last he entered into a chamber that was marvellously well dight and richly, 
and a bed arrayed with cloth of gold and richest that might be thought, and one lying therein, and thereby stood a table of clean gold with four pillars of silver that bear up the table, and upon the table stood a marvellous spear strangely wrought. And when Balin saw that spear, he gat it in his hand, and turned him to King Pelham, and smote him passingly sore with that spear. And King Pelham fell down in a swoon, and therewith the castle roof and walls break, and fell to the earth, and Balin fell down, so that he might not stir foot nor hand. And so the most part of the castle that was fallen down through that dolorous stroke lay upon Pelham and Balin three days. Chapter 16 then Merlin came thither, and took up Balin, and gat him a good horse, for his was dead, and bade him ride out of that country. "'I would have my damosel,' said da Balin. "'Lo,' said Merlin, "'where she lieth dead.' And King Pelham lay so, many years, sore wounded, and might never be whole till Galahad the Hout Prince healed him in the quest of the Sangreal, for in that place was part of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that Joseph of Arimathea brought into this land, and there himself lay in that rich bed, and that was the same spear that Longaius smote our Lord to the heart, and King Pelham was nigh of Joseph's kin, and that was the most worshipful man that lived in those days, and great pity it was of his hurt, for through that stroke turned to great dole Trey and Teen. Then departed Balin from Merlin, and said, In this world we meet never no more. So he rode forth th through the fair countries and cities, and found the people dead, slain on every side. And all that were alive cried, O Balin, thou hast caused great damage in these countries, for the dolorous stroke thou gavest unto King Pelham, three countries are destroyed, and doubt not, but the vengeance will fall on thee at the last. When Balin was past those countries, he was passing fain. So he rode eight days, and he met with adventure. And at the last he came into a fair forest in the valley, and was ware of a tower. And there beside he saw a great horse of war tied to a tree. And there beside sat a fair knight on the ground, and made great mourning, and he was a likely and a well made. Balin said, God save you, why be ye so heavy? Tell me, and I will amend it, and I may, to my power. Sir knight, said he again, thou dost me great grief. For I was in merry thoughts, and now thou puttest me to more pain. Balin went a little from him, and looked on his horse, and then Balin heard him say thus, Ah, fair lady, why have ye broken my promise? For thou promised me to meet me here by noon, and I may curse thee that ever ye gave me this sword, for with this sword I slay myself, and pull it, it out. And therewith Balin stirred unto him, and took him by the hand. Let go my hand, said the knight, or else I shall slay thee. That shall not need, said Balin, for I shall promise you my help to get you your lady, and ye will tell me where she is. What is your name, said the knight? My name is Balin le Savage. Ah, sir, I know you well enough. Ye are the knight of the two swords, and the man with most prowess on your hands living. What is your name, said Balin? My name is Garnish of the Mount, a poor man's son, but my prowess and hardiness a duke ma hath made me a knight, and gave me lands. His name is Duke Hermel, and his daughter is she that I love, and she me as I deemed. How far is she hence? said Balin. But six miles, said the knight. Now we ride hence, said these two knights. So they rode more than a pace, till that they came to a fair castle well walled and ditched. I will into the castle, said Balin, and look if she be there. So he went in and searched from chamber to chamber, and found her bed, but she was not there. Then Balin looked into a fair little garden, and under a laurel tree he saw her lie upon a quilt of green samite, and a knight in her arms, fast halsing each other, and under their heads grass and herbs. When Balin saw her lie so with the foulest knight that he ever saw, and she a fair lady, then Balin went through all the chambers again, and told the knight how he found her as she had slept fast, and so brought him in the place, there she lay fast sleeping. Chapter 17 And when Garnish beheld her so lying, for pure sorrow his mouth and nose burst out a bleeding, and with his sword he smote off both their heads, and then he made sorrow out of measure, and said, O Balin, much sorrow hast thou brought unto me, for hast thou not showed me that sight I should have passed my sorrow? Forsooth, said Balin, I did it to this intent, that it should better thy courage, and that ye might see and know her falsehood. 
and to cause you to leave love of such a lady. God knoweth I did none other but as I would ye did to me. Alas, said Garnish, now is my sorrow double that I may not endure. Now have I slain that I loved most in all my life. And therewith suddenly he rove himself on his own sword unto its hilt. When Balin saw that, he dressed him there thenceward, lest folk should say he had slain them. And so he rode forth, and within three days he came by a cross, and thereon were letters of gold written, that said, It is not for no knight alone to ride toward this castle. Then saw he an old whore gentleman coming toward him, that said, Balin le Sauvage, thou passest thy bounds to come this way, therefore turn again, and it will avail thee. Then he had vanished away anon, and so he heard an horn, as it had been the death of a beast. That blast, said Balin, it blown for me, for I am the prize, and yet am I not dead. Anon withal he saw a hundred ladies and many knights, that welcomed him with fair semblant, and made him passing good cheer unto his sight, and led him into the castle. And there was dancing and minstrelry, and all manners of joy. Then the chief lady of the castle said, Knight with the two swords, ye must have ado and joust with a knight hereby that keepeth an island, for there may no man pass this way, but he must joust or he pass. That is an unhappy custom, said Balin, that a knight may not pass this way, but if he joust. Yet shall not have ado but with one knight, said the lady. Well, said Balin, since I shall thereto I am ready, but travelling men are oft weary, and their horses too. But though my horse be weary, my heart is not weary. I would be fain there my death should be. Sir, said a knight to the Balin, methinketh your shield is not good. I will lend you a bigger. Thereof I pray you. And so he took the shield that was unknown, and left his own, and so rode unto the island, and put him and his horse in a great boat. And when he came to the other side, he met with a damosel, and she said, Who, oh, knight Balin, why have ye you left your own shield? Alas, ye have put yourself in great danger, for by your shield ye should have been known. It is great pity of you, as ever was of night. For of thy prowess and hardiness thou hast no fellow living. Me repenteth, said Balin, that ever I came within this country, that I may not turn now again for shame, and what adventure shall fail to me, be it life or death. I will take the adventure that shall come unto me. And then he looked on his armor, and understood he was well armed, and therewith blessed him, and mounted upon his horse. Chapter 18 Then afore him he saw come riding out of the castle a knight, and his horse trapped all red, and himself in the same color. When this knight in the red beheld Balin, him thought it should be his brother Balin, by cause of his two swords, but by cause he knew not his shield, he deemed it was not he. And so they aventured their spears, and came marvel marvelously fast together, and they smote each other in the shields. But their spears and their course were so big that it bare down horse and man, that they lay both in a swoon. But Balin was bruised sore with the fall of his horse, for he was weary of travel. And Balin was the first that rose on foot, and drew his sword, and went towards Balin, and he arose and he went against him. But Balan smote Balin first, and he put up his shield, and smote him through the shield, and tamed his helm. Then Balin smote him again with that unhappy sword, and well nigh he felt his brother Balin, and so they fought there together till their breaths failed. Then Balin looked up to the castle, and saw the towers stand full of ladies. So they went unto battle again, and wounded every each other dolefully. And then they breathed oft times, and so went unto battle, that all the place there, as they fought, was blood red. And at that time there was none of them both, but they had either smitten other seven great wounds, so the last of them might have been the death of the mightiest giant in this world. Then they went to battle again so marvelously, that doubt it was to hear of that battle for the great bloodshedding, and their hauberks unnailed, that naked they were on every side. At last Balin, the younger brother, withdrew him a little and laid him down. Then said Balin, Les Sauvages, 
what knight art thou? For or now I found never no knight that matched me. My name is, said he, Balan, brother unto the good knight Balin. Alas, said Balin, that ever I should see this day, and therewith he fell backward in a swoon. Then Balan yeed on all four feet and hands, and put off the helm off his brother, and might not know him by the visage, it was so full hewn and bled. But when he awoke, he said, O oh, Balan, my brother, thou hast slain me, and I thee. Wherefore all the wide world shall speak of us both. Alas, said Balin, that ever I saw this day, that through mishap I might not know you, for I espied well your two swords, but by cause ye had another shield, I deemed ye be another knight. Alas, said Balin, all that made an unhappy knight in the castle, for he caused me to leave my own shield that are both destruction, and if I might live, I would destroy that castle for ill customs. That were well done, said Balan, for I had never grace to depart from him since that I came hither, for here it happed me to slay a knight that kept this island, and since might I never depart, and no more should ye, brother, and ye might have slain me as ye have, and escaped yourself with the life. Right so came the lady of the tower with four knights and six ladies and six yeomen unto them, and there she heard how they made their moan either to other, and said, We both came out of one tomb, that is to say one mother's belly, and so shall we lie both in one pit. So Balin prayed the lady of her gentleness, for his true service, that she would bury them both in the same place there the battle was done. And she granted them, with weeping, it should be done richly in the best manner. Now will ye send for a priest, that we may receive our sacrament, and receive the blessed body of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yea, said one lady, it shall be done. And so she sent for a priest, and gave them their rites. Now, said Balin, when we are buried in one tomb, and the mention made over us how two brethren slew each other, there will never good knight nor good man see our tomb, but they will pray for our souls. And so all the ladies and gentlewomen wept for pity. Then anon Balan died, but Balin died not till the midnight after. And so were they buried both, and the lady let make a mention of Balan, how he was there slain by his brother's hands, but she knew not Balin's name. Chapter 19 In the morn came Merlin, and let write Balin's name on the tomb with letters of gold, that here lieth Balin le Sauvage, that was the knight with the two swords, and he that smote the dol dolorous stroke. Also Merlin let there be a bed, that there should never man lie therein, but he went out of his wit. Yet Launcelot du Lac fordid that bed through his noblesse. And anon after Balin was dead, Merlin took his sword, and took off the pommel, and set on another pommel. So Merlin bade a knight that stood afore him handle that sword, and he essayed, and he might not handle it. Then Merlin laughed. Why laugh ye, said the knight. This is the cause, said Merlin. There shall never man handle this sword but the best knight in the world, and that shall be Sir Launcelot, or else Galahad his son. And Launcelot, with his sword, shall slay the man that in the world he loved best, that shall be Sir Gawain. All this he let write in the pommel of the sword. Then Merlin let make a bridge of iron and steel into that island, but it was but half a foot broad, and there shall never man pass that bridge, nor have hardiness to go over, but if he were a passing good man, and a good knight without treachery or villainy. Also the scabbard of Balin's sword, Merlin left it on the side of the island, that Galahad should find it. Also Merlin let make his subtlety that Balin's sword was put in a marble stone standing upright, as great as a millstone. And the stone hoved always above the water, and did many years. And so by adventure it swam down the stream to the city of Camelot, that is in English Winchester. And that same day Galahad the Hout Prince came with King Arthur, and so Galahad brought with him the scabbard and achieved the sword that was there in the marble stone, hoving it upon the water. And on Whit Sunday he achieved the sword as it is rehearsed in the book of Sangreal. 
Soon after this was done, Merlin came to King Arthur and told him of the dolorous stroke that Balin gave King Pelham, and how Balin and Balan fought together the marvelous battle that ever was heard of, and how they were buried both in one tomb. Alas, said King Arthur, this is the greatest pity that ever I heard tell of two knights, for in the world I know not such two knights. Thus endeth the tale of Balin and Balan, two brethren born in Northumberland, good knights. End of Book 2, Chapters 14-19 through 19 of Lamorte Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory.